Hello everyone. I've been putting off making this video for too long, but I think it's time we have an honest conversation about the M drive. If you're a normal person, you're probably asking yourself, what is the M drive? Well, it sure ain't that. That is a Hall effect thruster, a type of ion engine. The real M drive is a lot homelier, which kind of explains why so many news articles like to use the picture of an ion engine instead. But still, we're no closer to understanding what an M drive is. So I'll just let the guy who invented the thing explain that to you. M drive is a new class of electrical machine. It's one which directly converts electrical energy into thrust, uh, but does not need reaction mass. Um, so it's, um, it's like a rocket engine, but without the exhaust plume. You can kind of do that. Light exerts some pressure, so if you put a flashlight in space, it will start to move, but it takes a staggering amount of power. To get a measly newton of force, you will need 300 megawatts. I think Scheuer means something different. Um, at its heart, there is a microwave cavity, a resonant microwave cavity, and the special shape of this cavity enables the momentum in the electromagnetic wave, which is propagating inside the, the cavity, to be transferred to the cavity itself. That's like expecting to move a spacecraft by playing ping pong inside of it. Take a night, Harry. Oh. <clears throat> he goes on to explain that this device is not only possible, but explainable with classical physics alone. M drive produces thrust in one direction, um, and if it's uh, allowed to, it will accelerate in the opposite direction. Um, uh, momentum is conserved by this process. In fact, M drive is based purely on classic physics, um, the, the physics of, of, of Maxwell, um, Newton, and Einstein. Rest assured, it is not. Let's do a little thought experiment. You have an M-Drive powered spacecraft, initially at rest. Its momentum is its mass times its velocity, so it's zero. You turn it on and leave it running for a day or so. It doesn't expel anything out the back, not even light, but it accelerates all the same. You then turn off the M-Drive and allow the spaceship to coast. The electromagnetic fields inside the cavity have dissipated, so all you have left is a spaceship moving with a certain velocity. So its final momentum is not equal to zero. Momentum is not conserved. Momentum conservation is an extremely important law. Eminota has taught us that any time you change something about your experiment and you get the same result, there is an associated conserved quantity. What I mean by this is that the fact that you're allowed to choose where you're going to perform your experiment, and you don't expect the result to depend on that too much, is enough to prove that momentum has to be conserved. This result is called Notice Theorem. So people like Scheuer have a huge burden of proof to overcome. But it's actually even worse than that. Because any device that works like the M-Drive is supposed to is also a perpetual motion machine. To see this, just recall that work is force times distance. So power, which is work over time, is force times velocity. Now you see the problem. The power being drained from the M-Drive's batteries is constant. So once the M-Drive moves fast enough, it's producing more energy than you put in. A conventional rocket would run out of propellant long before this happened, but the M-Drive doesn't use any propellant. The cost saving, um, it's um, uh, better than 10 times the cost saving that has been uh, thought necessary to make um, solar power satellites viable, for instance. I don't know why you'd bother. Any of these M-Drive flying cars would produce more energy than you put in once it goes faster than a bicycle. You could just hook them up to a turbine and go to town. All the free energy you'll ever need. But maybe you're still unconvinced. Maybe you think that one good test is worth a thousand expert opinions. That may be so, but an expert opinion is certainly not worth less than a bad test. Remember those faster than light neutrinos? Ah, but now there's a paper on the M-Drive. And it's even peer-reviewed. So that means it's correct, right? Well, no. That's really not how it works. A lot of people seem to misunderstand the process of peer review. 
For example, these guys. Um, for those of you who don't know what the peer review process is, basically, if you're a scientist, you do your work, you do your research, and then you write up a report, and then people from your field grab your report, they look at your procedures, they perform your experiment based upon your procedures, and they try to see if they can get a similar result. If there's a thousand people that do a peer, in your peer review that do the experiment, 500 of them do it, do it and they get the same result, 500 of them do it and they all get a different result, you gotta go back to the drawing board. Peer review is all basically about replication. Can, is there successful replication of the results? Wow. If 1,000 scientists had to take time out of their work to replicate somebody else's experiment any time a paper is published, nothing would ever get done. Peer review is not about replication. It's much humbler. A small number of guys, typically three, read the paper and see if it sounds stupid to them. That's really all there is to it. Replication is an important part of science, but it doesn't happen during peer review. Moreover, an earth-shattering result such as this really ought to be published in a high-profile physics journal like Nature or PRL. Instead, the paper was sent to a propulsion journal, which is a little bit suspect. After all, this is supposed to be a scientific experiment, not a thruster prototype. What is also a little bit suspect is that Harold White, one of these studies' authors, knows that any device like the M drive is a perpetual motion machine. He acknowledges the problem in this paper. In Appendix A, he asks, when does a propellantless thruster give you more energy than what you put in? White's argument is that the same problem happens for any kind of rocket. He considers a spacecraft of mass 10,000 kilograms, initially moving with speed 371 kilometers per second. Yeah, I know. It's his numbers, not mine. Anyway, the initial kinetic energy is approximately 688 terajoules. Now you turn on the rocket engine. You toss 540 kilograms of propellant out the back, so the new mass is 9,460 kilograms. Your speed changed by 1 kilometer per second, so your new speed is 372 kilometers per second. So your final kinetic energy is 655 terajoules. The astute among you may notice that 655 is less than 688, so you never got more energy than you put in. There's no doubt White noticed this because he wrote, The change in kinetic energy is 33,000 gigajoules. Technically correct is the best kind of correct, I suppose, but where I come from, we have a word for that. It begins with F and ends with rod. Anyway, back to the paper at hand. It should be noted that the kinds of forces that these guys are measuring are of the order of the weight of a grain of sand. A tiny one. It's actually quite hard to weigh a grain of sand. Any number of things can throw off your measurement, so you have to make sure that it is not only precise, but also accurate. One of them is to quantify very carefully the kinds of factors that could throw off your experiment, and then show that their effect is small. Another is a control test, for example, using a cylindrical, untapered M-drive cavity. But they, they didn't do anything. All they have is a section entitled Error Sources, which reads like an undergraduate lab report. Just check out the weasel words. Nearly the same. We don't think it's likely. And some of it is just comically wrong. Really, the paper is quite thin. I mean, these guys have been at it for years, and all they have to show for it are what? 18 data points? That don't even fit on a line properly? And to be sure, some people have reanalyzed EagleWorks' data and showed that if you properly account for thermal effects, the measured thrust disappears. So there you have it. There really isn't much to this so-called impossible drive, quote-unquote. Stay tuned for part two, where I will address some of the theories that have been put forth to explain its operation.